Right, we're here today at the read through. This is the first proper gathering of all of us for the read through of episodes one, two, and three. And it's very exciting because we've been working on this for months, for years. But this is the first day we all come together. Scene one. London, exterior night, London at night, coming down to an alleyway, scene two, where a wind picks up and a wheezing, grinding noise, and there's the TARDIS, hooray, it fades into being, and this doctor, step, look, there he is, this doctor steps out. You come into a room, you've got David Tennant, you've got Catherine Tate, you've got Bernard Crippins. I think the whole room sighed when Bernard Crippins said his first line. It, all the words and all the scripts are just irrelevant until you give it to the actors. They're just what it's all about. We have notes now. After every read through, you've got to have notes. It's like some lines got to be tweaked, some bits don't quite work, some bits could be better. I had a bit of this, that got a laugh, that didn't. So every single read through in the world always has a note session. There'll be a new draft then delivered in the next few days. But really, we start filming in six days' time. Oh, oh, hold on, hold on, let me help. Uh, he takes down the top box, he takes down the second box, and he sees Donna Noble. Thank you very much. He puts the box back. All right, do you mind? Quite frankly, I have a good time on these days because no one likes my scripts more than me. Everyone else can have a moan and pick away at it. I love them. So <laughs> I'm very, very happy. Properly, though, I'm genuinely happy because we've all put a lot of work into them. The words are just the beginning, all the visuals the directors are working on, the design teams and effects teams, so... This is just the beginning, but I'm properly excited. I can't, I can't wait to see these. I'm thrilled. Originally, I saw the casting call for a trans character called Lily. I saw it and I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. We know the trans role after Hearts Done I'm going to go for it. I had no clue it was Doctor Who. I had no clue it was Rose. Yeah. It went from there. Rose is a 15-year-old girl. Um, she's from London. Her mum is Catherine Tate, Donna Noble. And acting Catherine has been amazing. She welcomed me with open arms, and the acting with her was great, because I learned a lot from her. It is beyond, beyond whatever I could have imagined coming back. Obviously, I hoped and guessed if I was going to be, it was going to be David and Catherine, but you never know. And then, of course, when that's confirmed, it's just super exciting. And then Carl, and again, then being introduced to Yasmin. Just every day brings something joyous. It's great to be back, actually, and to have Russell writing these, and, you know, it feels a sort of iconic moment, really. To get another go at being in this world and working with David and working with Russell and having all the family back together, Plus more, you know what I mean? Is just DCT, dream come true. Uh, we've been prepping an area of the set, which is the interior of Donna's house. Uh, we've used a combination of various pyrotechnics, um, some of them high explosive, to, to really break and give it a good punch. We built this amazing set, and then on day two, we started by blowing up the back door. It's phenomenal. It's like bonfire night. <laughs> OK, so I think they've just finished uh, rigging and, and doing the big explosion so that us, the Roth, can start surging in. So that's going to be our first shot coming up next. The first thing we've, uh, we've filmed up on the stilts, Stephen and I, very excited. Hello. We have just been invaded. Our house has been invaded by the war warriors, and they are looking for the meat. And the house is exploding. So there are actual live. I think they're called zircons. The actual pellets, which sounds like another alien race itself. You'll see me with a paintball gun, and we're shooting projectiles. Now they're little zirconian hits, and it's basically a, uh, a material that, when it hits something, it sparks. Uh, Danny had to build the shields, we had to hang them. Had to have, hang a first shield, hang a second shield. It's real bulletproof plexiglass, is that right? I think it is. Yeah. But it still Incredible. hits them. Incredible. Yeah, I mean, they, so they make a real bang and a real crash and flash. Yeah. It's quite, it's quite easy to act, therefore. Nice day at work. <laughs> nice day at work. We're in a decommissioned power station just outside Cardiff and Uskmouth. This has been a location for Doctor Who many times, uh, but this time it's, it's playing an operating steelworks that the Meeps ship crashes into. That ship didn't crash, it parked. No signs of life? Not yet. We don't know what kind of life we're looking for. Oh, it was amazing to see the rocket. It's huge, absolutely huge. We've got the bottom of the Meep ship and then the rest of it will be created digitally afterwards. But it's, it's quite, even there, it's quite substantial. You can, you can, 
stand under the, the prongs of the rocket. It's quite, it's quite impressive. Uh, so we built the leg section and the underside on location. I think there was a three or four week build. Uh, a lot of steel work going in because the legs alone were huge structure. Then we had to go back in and redress around the chute for the different stages of the spaceship when it's first crashed, then it's been cleared back, then the dagger drive's been fixed. So there was all the different phases that need to be worked into the schedule as well. Too good for us now. Evening. Doctor. That's a double-bladed dagger drive damaged by laser fire, which means we've got two sets of visitors at war with each other. Nice to meet you. I just love the relationship that Shirley and the Doctor have. You can tell they it's like their souls have met before, which I think is really, really lovely. She's not one to um, let him get away with much, and I love that. Not you, mate. I've got this. Off you pop. Bye-bye. Waited your whole life? You wish. It was at this location that we had Pat Mills and Dave Gibbons come to visit, uh, who, of course, are the, the creators of the Meep uh, and the Rorth Warriors and, indeed, this whole story. I didn't know what the first episode was going to be. The script pinged through on an email, and it says on the front page, written by Russell T. Davis, adapted from The Star Beast by Pat Mills and Dave Gibbons. And I remember that comic strip. I was nine or ten. I remember it really vividly. I couldn't quite believe that this had happened. It seemed such an unlikely bit of source material. And then, of course, you think, well, of course it's not. It was such a great story. The fact that I remember it so clearly from, I don't know, 40 years ago, uh, clearly says something about how tenacious it is as a piece of storytelling. That meeting of the domestic and the fantastical, which I think Doctor Who does particularly well and Russell does brilliantly, all sort of meets in that story. So uh, being initially kind of gobsmacked that we were uh, retelling a story that I'd first read in Doctor Who Weekly when I was tiny, I after kind of reeling for a moment, I thought that it does make perfect sense. It's been amazing to see something that only existed inside my head to be drawn on a piece of paper actually exists all around me in, in, in real life, and you've captured the tone of it and the design of it so amazingly well. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. We've got the puppet of the Meep, and then the actual VFX version will be overlaid to like get all the actual emotion and stuff like that. Right. So this was a this was a scale test or a hair test, and they were fantastic. It's quite funny. Straight out of the comic book, the whole subtext of the Star Beast, uh, seeing that come together, that's very much the way I, I write anyway, where I flip things over so that what you think is one thing, it's actually something else. Things that seem innocent and cute. Are not necessarily so. It's absolutely spot on. I couldn't imagine this better. This is what I was seeing in my head. That's so malevolent. That's Brilliant. wonderful. Yeah. And then, equally, you can have these sinister characters who are actually good guys. And that's really at the, the, the heart of the way I write. Seeing that validated in this really epic way is, is actually quite important to me, I think. I'm pleased when you saw it, you were like, there's the meep. Yes. That's Definitely. a big yeah. win for us, because yeah. yeah. if you'd come and seen one of the other ones, you'd be like, what have they done? Close. <laughs> so well. the we, I mean, we spent quite a while thinking, oh, we need to contemporise it, we need to add textures, we need to sort of think about it in different alien or insectoid ways, and every time Russell would bring it back to, it's, it's still not quite Roth enough, and, and what we realise is, <laughs> We needed the Dave Gibbons Roth, you know, we needed the... Everybody needs the Dave Gibbons Roth. Well, they're going to have it. <laughs> yeah. What is great is the enthusiasm of everybody for the project. Your creation is looming above you. <laughs> you know, everybody is a fan of the original comic, and you can feel that love and that going above and beyond what you strictly need to do just to make it the best you can, and that's really flattering. For this job, for the first time, they used something I'd never, I'd never seen before, which was this handheld scanner, where they scan you head to toe. It took about five minutes maximum, and then they can 3D print that life size. So there now exists a mold of me lying around the the Millennium FX workshop, so that they could build these suits specifically to me. So it should hopefully fit perfectly. We've kind of gone for a yeah. kind of prey mantis esque. Vibe with kind of flamingo legs. Yeah, my first time on stilts ever. These are called digi legs. It's kind of, it's like walking on extreme tiptoes. It's not that uncomfortable, it's just yeah. kind of unusual. And you can't actually stand still. But there's a kind of surprising range of motion with them, really, mm. that we're going to hopefully try and use for the, for the performance. Perfect. Yeah.
Right, as soon as we're polished. Yeah, so that's what your eyes look like. So the vision is limited. You can, we can just see through what I guess are his nostrils. But um, we've done lots of rehearsals. So uh, using a mask, we have created eye holes, and this is pretty much our, our limited vision. So we're only really going to be able to see uh, kind of directly in front of us and kind of no peripheral. So not a lot. <laughs> so we actually have an earpiece in, in this ear, in my real ear, uh, which means we have a live feed from the set, so we can hear the, the, the first AD and some of the dialogue, and also from Paul, our uh, creature choreographer, so he can give us direction live on set while we're performing about angles and eye position and, uh, and yeah, where the camera is and eye lines and things like that. Yes, please, start lighting up. Uh, let me know when you're lit and clear. We're shooting a huge battle scene, uh, the battle of the road, with the Rorth coming down one side and good unit and bad unit and exploding cars and it's, it's big action. To get permission to be on anybody's street and blow things up all night long um, is incredible. I've been involved in the show for many, many years. It's my job to make sure that we try and do something different. We've been doing quite a bit of action, and this is the um, crescendo of chaos, shall we say. So uh, essentially what we've got here is somebody firing a missile at the Land Rover that you see behind me. And the idea is that that's going to explode and create some carnage. We've got a piston rig that's going to fling the car up into the air the moment it explodes. So we'll cut from the missile being fired to the point it hits the car or the Land Rover and it will flip up into the air and it will explode. It's obviously very important to make sure that that Land Rover doesn't land on someone. Background action! Three, two, one! Oh my god, that was fab. <laughs> yeah, so at the end of episode one, I'm back on the TARDIS. Or Donna. And uh, yes, yeah, she spills coffee on the console, and uh, that leads to a catastrophic fire. Here we are, having a coffee. What's going to go wrong? Oh my god, I did it again! Only Russell would give us a script that it, it unveils the brand new TARDIS and then blows it up within seconds. I mean, I read that and my head was in my hands. I was like, oh, I can't believe you're actually going to do this to us. We've got a, a network of pipes which are going to pipe into the, into the set itself and then we're going to have all these like copper tubes. We call them witch's fingers for obvious reasons. So when, when, when we bend them up, we're going to have all flame sources coming out so it looks like the console's on fire. Um, so that does two things. Visually looks cool, but also, secondly, it, it's keeping the fire away from the actual console itself. Don't forget to click below to subscribe to the official Doctor Who YouTube channel.